It's in verse uh, 7 through 12. Paul preaches until midnight. I love that story. Uh, next week, we'll be preaching until midnight. It's biblical. It's biblical. We don't have a third loft, and I don't think anyone's going to be falling out of any windows, but, <laughs> but uh, there will be preaching till midnight. And so, uh, anyway, I like reading about that story. And then, one of my favorite parts of the Bible, and not very many people would probably say that, is when Paul chooses to go afoot from Miletus to Asos, however you pronounce that. And, uh, and I've often won. Of course, if you look that up, he at least went, I believe, if you look it up, he at least went a marathon, right? 26.2 miles is a marathon. At least went that. I think it was 31 miles, which is an ultra marathon, but that's just me. <laughs> went on this long uh, journey where everybody else, some have said, well, maybe he was, you know, a little motion sickness and didn't want to go on the, the boat ride. I don't know what it was, but they sailed there and he decided to go on foot. So he went on this long hike. Well, if you keep reading, you find out he's fixing to talk to all the elders, round up all the elders in Ephesus. And he knows that he's getting ready to go into Jerusalem. And everywhere he goes, there keep, the people keep prophesying, if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to die. And instead of taking that, and I'm not going to say whether he was right or wrong, but instead of taking that as the Holy Spirit is telling me not to go to Jerusalem, he says, hey, I'm willing to die for the Lord. And so he goes, knowing I'm probably going to die in Jerusalem. And you can see that's heavy on his heart. So I kind of put that together and say, well, maybe he wanted to go on this long hike clear his head, think about some things, maybe think about what he was going to say to the, to the elders there in Ephesus. He was very close to them, and he was going to leave them with some, some parting words, farewell words. This might be the last time I see you. Let me impart some words to you, and, and that's very possible. Now, uh, he gets to Ephesus, Ephesus, and somehow he rounds them all up. You say, okay, here's what, most, here's what a lot of people think. There's a, there's a, uh, a doctrine out there um, that talks about the elders, okay, or we would call them pastors or bishops, and uh, and there is a, a teaching out there that says what they call a plurality of elders. So like every church is supposed to have not just one elder, but a plurality of elders, which is kind of weird because even if you have that setting, I can guarantee there's going to be one person that's going to be the chief elder or something like that. So there's you know it's it's kind of an interesting idea because the theory is no 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 everybody has equal you know say. There's multitude of elders. Anyway, I won't even spend a lot of time in that. But what I think happened is, look, it's not like there was only one church in Ephesus, and there were so many people in that church, mega church, you know, that they had to have all these elders. Things were a lot different during that time. And what I think happened is they were all spread out throughout Ephesus, probably heading church, kind of a house churches, that kind of an idea. But it's one church, all right? They're just spread, spread apart into smaller groups. And occasionally they would come assemble together, probably. And, and so he gathered them, gathers them all together. He calls it, you know, the, the church of Ephesus. But he gathers them all together, and he wants to talk to those elders. That's just my uh, opinion on that, by the way. But anyway, he gets there, and he, he gives them uh, some encouraging words and some instructions. Here's what I want you to do. I'm going to be gone. I, I really think he thought he was going to die. He says, I'm going to be gone, but here's some things you need to do. Verse 28, he says, you need to feed the flock, which is, by the way, one of the primary purposes of, uh, or the my, primary job descriptions, if you will, of the elder to teach and to preach God's word and to feed the flock with the word of God. And then he says also that grievous wolves shall enter in among you. Okay, watch for those people that are going to come in, spread heresy, cause problems, cause division, all that. You need to be aware of that is what he tells the elders there. And then he says, not only that, men among you shall rise up to draw men away. You know, not just these grievous wolves that are going to come in. Hey, he's like looking at all of them and say, hey, in the assembly right now, you're going to find out some people are going to turn on you or cause problems or whatever. And he's telling them to be aware of that. And then he says, uh, you know, he talks about his own ministry and basically saying, hey, follow my example. So well, that doesn't sound very humble of him. Actually, I believe Paul was a very humble guy, but he was just saying, hey, I, I've tried my best to live an example for you, and so whenever I'm gone, hey, follow that example that I set for you. And he says, one thing he says, when I came to you, I was not covetous of your silver or your gold. I wasn't trying to get gain from you and uh, make a lot of money off you. I wasn't selling you anything or anything like that. He's, he's saying that he worked 
and he ministered and he gave to them. He, he was all about the giving, not the receiving. And so here's what he says in verse 35. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, I don't know if you ever tried to look up, where did Jesus say that? Where in the Bible does Jesus say it is more blessed to give than to receive? And I can't find it. And I have a suspicion that if you try to look it up, you're not going to be able to find it. And yet, it is the Word of God because we have it right here. <laughs> okay? So it is recorded for us. Sometimes it's hard to find other things in the Bible. But John 21, 25 uh, I was thinking about this verse. It says, and there are, uh, and this is after John gives his, uh, the, his gospel account. He says, there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. And so uh, we don't have a record of him saying that, but we know he said a lot of things that we don't have the records of. And here uh, it, it, it's saying that this is something that Jesus said, something that Jesus taught. Now we could look at other verses and say, well, it certainly lines up with some of the things that Jesus taught. Uh, but as far as that actual quote, I don't think it's there. But here's the thing. We've heard that a lot in our lives probably. People say, well, it's more blessed to give than to receive. That's easy to say, isn't it? It's easy to say, well, I just like to give to other people. I'm not concerned about getting anything from it. <laughs> But who actually, who do you think actually lives like they believe that? Like everything I give, man, I just, I just want, it's just so, blessed. I'm just so happy to give people things and I don't want anything in return. I can't think that often, even in my own life, where there's absolutely no selfish motivation behind my giving, right? You say, how dare you say that? I believe if you consider your own heart, it's probably the, uh, true as well. Uh, and that, so anyway, I was just recently, for whatever reason, I was reading, uh, well, I, I got some good reasons for it, but I was reading on the, uh, the life of Bill Gates, okay, and, and I was particularly thinking about the vaccines and, and why he has a hand in that. I think it was back in like 2015, uh, he, he did a little TED Talk where he was talking about getting involved in the, the vaccines and trying to create some vaccines and he said that you know the we don't we haven't done enough in our society to guard against uh, uh viruses and stuff like that and so he had this idea about having getting vaccines and if you look up you know his here here he made millions yay billions right from microsoft and then all of a sudden he switched he retired from that and he switched and, and now he's just a full-time philanthropist is what he says okay philanthropist is somebody who gives her money and does good with it okay and so if you look at you'll see he recently gave like four billion dollars to creating vaccines and stuff like that now let me ask you this do you think bill gates is just some wonderful guy who just so loving and caring and just wants to save the world and he wants to use all his money for good i really don't think so <laughs> okay so i did a little research right not a whole lot i'm not gonna say <clears throat> but you know bill gates uh -huh is friends with Warren Buffett. These are two of the, you know, close to the most, ri the richest people in, in the world, especially, uh, it's definitely in our in our country. And they teamed up, they gathered together, they, they both invest in some of the same major companies, which by the way, they invest in Walmart, Amazon, uh, you know, all, and, and by the way, there's like four companies that are producing vaccines right now that are putting out the COVID vaccine. They're invested in them, and uh, and they're they're investing in all these things. Which, by the way, I'm, and this isn't even a conspiracy theory. I'm just telling you the facts here. They're invested in these. Have you noticed that Walmart's not hurting right now? <laughs> Amazon's not hurting right now with the COVID-19 thing. Uh, we we have uh, some of these businesses are having record sales every month since this COVID thing started. Sure. You know, I know people that work in in uh, uh, like uh, hardware stores, you know, or farming stores. Uh, and, uh, you know, they have told me like they're having a record set. I remember from, from like uh, June, probably till even now, if you drive by Home Depot, I mean, just like maybe not today because it's Christmas Eve, but you drive by, it's just full. The parking lot's just backed up all the time. You know, the grocery stores, 
fast food restaurants, the major corporations, the major companies, they're doing okay during COVID-19. Our government, you say, yeah, but our government realizes that everybody's falling apart. Look, all our government, the officials seem to be doing right now is getting themselves in a position for the next four years, trying to give themselves a promotion and get into place. You know, you say, oh yeah, but they're trying to give us stimulus money. No, they're not. They're sending money over to foreign countries. They're sending money. They want to send money to Pakistan for gender research or something like that. <laughs> like this is the money that's supposed to be like helping out our country. Look, they don't really. It's not like they just have this heart that just loves everybody. I'm not saying all, all, all of them are wicked in that way, but it's not that they just have this heart. All the things that they're doing, have, they have a vested interest. So you say, okay, we have what he gave four billion. Bill Gates gave four billion dollars to the to helping with the production of the vaccine. Well, yeah, he's also invested in those companies, <laughs> which means he's going to get money back from all the billions and billions of, of dollars that they're going to make off of the vaccines. <laughs> Bill Gates, one of the things that he really got going, by the way, has made bukus of money off of it, is a vaccine that they pushed throughout the whole world, which is a contraceptive vaccine. A vaccine. They take a shot so that they can't have babies. And they say, hey, we need to spread this. I'm not joking. Look it up. Other parts of the world, man, we need to go to these places, these third world countries, and make sure they get these shots so they can stop having babies. I'm telling you, he's not just like just this loving guy. And I'm not preaching against Bill Gates. I don't, I don't really care, you know, about him in particular. My point is this. When you see in the world somebody who gives and they give and they give, oftentimes there's a vested interest. Right? It looks like they're giving and caring but probably they're trying to get something in return. And don't, uh, you know, you, we know that these businessmen, these very smart, very wealthy men, you know, they, there's a reason they have so much money. They're sharp, okay? And they know how to make money. And the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. And so you can always follow the trail and the love of money is gonna be behind a lot of this stuff they're doing, okay? But not only that, let's just think about this, okay? Hopefully it's not always this way, but in our own lives, we understand that around Christmas time, oftentimes people will give a gift and they're thinking, hey, if I give them a gift, I'm expecting a gift back. Or maybe not exactly that, but it's like, okay, that person's going to give me a gift and then I'm going to feel really bad if I don't give them a gift and I don't want to feel bad, so I better give them a gift. If you think about it, a lot of our giving can be kind of selfishly motivated. And so, uh, so this is definitely a possibility. Uh, so when we go around saying, hey, it's more blessed to give than to receive, and that, that's easy to say, but that doesn't necessarily mean uh, that we do that all the time. Okay, uh, sometimes we give because we want to see be seen of men. The Bible has something to say about that, doesn't it? Jesus says not to do that, to be seen of men. Yeah. Look, if you are seen of men for your for you know giving to other people giving your alms or whatever well then great people are going to say what a giving person what a caring loving person you've been seen of men now the bible says you have your reward right on earth that dies when you die right yeah. you no longer have that uh sometimes we give just because we feel good about ourselves you know there are people out there that uh, they live wickedly but they go to church and maybe give a whole bunch of money to the church or something like that thinking that it makes them feel better about themselves. Like, I'm just kind of like paying for my sins or something like that. And uh, that's not supposed to be the reason for our giving, okay? It's not just to uh, appease ourselves, make ourselves feel good. And even, even if we give, uh, let's look at Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Sometimes people even give and it's almost superstitious. They're hoping that if they give, then they're going to get back more than what they give. Like there's a superstitious principle where God's just just going to do that no matter what. Okay. And I, look, I'm I do believe that God does that. And here's a here's a verse about it. Luke six verse thirty eight says, uh, "Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over, shall men give into your bosom." For with the same measure that ye meet, withal it, shall, wither, withal it shall be measured to you again. And so, look, there's this principle. A lot of people say, you you know, the more you give, the more God gives, and you can never outgive God. Hey, all that's true. I believe that. 
But you see how all of a sudden our whole focus on giving could be because we are hoping that we're going to get more. And so there's a little bit of a selfish motivation there. Okay, but there's much to be said in the Bible about both giving and receiving. And so I'm going to talk about that tonight. First, I want to start with receiving. Is it wrong to receive a gift? <clears throat> I've not seen a whole lot of people in my life with this mentality, but I have seen uh, I have seen that. And I don't. I, it seems like uh, uh, there's some denominations out there. I'm not quite sure if Jehovah's Witnesses or Seventh Day Adventists or what. It seems like there's some denominations out there that teach that it's wrong to ever give gifts. I could be wrong on that. I would think uh, Jehovah's Witnesses because they're you know. They don't do birthdays and Christmas and stuff, so maybe they they teach that. I, don't quote me on that. <clears throat> but I have met an independent Baptist one time. Um, we were invited, one of our kids were invited over to their house, and they were having a birthday party, but they were like, we don't do gifts. We don't allow gifts. We don't, we don't believe in taking gifts. And that puzzled me. I didn't understand that. It, it was foreign to my thinking. I didn't understand it. But let me tell you this, and I, I, I'll just tell you right now, I don't believe that it's wrong to give gifts, and I'll give you, I'll get, uh, or to receive gifts, and I'll get to that in a minute. But let me uh, say this, as you're reading through the Bible, there are definitely some verses that will get you to start thinking, hey, maybe I should never take a gift. And so let's look at a couple of those. Exodus 23. Exodus 23, verse 8. It says, and thou shalt take no gift, for the gift blindeth the wise, and perverteth the words of the righteous. Look at Deuteronomy 16, similar verse. Numbers, Deuteronomy 16, and verse 19. Thou shalt not rest judgment. Okay, that's talking about... You know, instead of making a right judgment, resting, you think about uh, kind of like twisting and, and making it fit. You know, so basically it would be dishonest. Uh, not rest judgment. Thou shalt not respect persons, neither take a gift. For a gift doth blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of the righteous. Look at Proverbs 17. This is the last one we'll look at. There's a whole lot in the Bible, but I just want to give you a sampling here. Proverbs 17, verse 23. Proverbs 17, 23 says, A wicked man taketh a gift out of the bosom to pervert the ways of judgment. But you notice all these verses, what you see is the idea of somebody trying to butter you up, trying to give you a gift so that you won't, you'll look the other way. You know, and the Bible's saying, hey, if you're wise, you won't take gifts that are given to you in that with that kind of an attitude. Now, particularly as a pastor, I can see where that could be a big problem because a pastor could get somebody in the church who's like a big giver. Maybe they have a lot of money and they could easily kind of butter up a person. Maybe there's something that they want them to teach or some policy that they want them to put in place. And I've heard, a lot, I've never had it happen, but I've heard a lot of pastors who have talked about situations in their church where they've had that. And the person with, the, uh, with lots of money or whatever will give gifts and they'll try to uh, entice that pastor to make a certain policy change or something like that. Look, if he's wise, he's not going to accept that. He's not going to be moved by that. He's not going to, you know, make exception for his judgment and for the way he preaches and, and, and what he does for the Lord just because somebody's dangling a gift in front of his face. I think that's the idea of all those verses. <clears throat> but if someone tried to say, no, 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 I think it's just wrong to ever take a gift. Well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Think about it. If it's wrong to receive a gift, then it would be wrong to give a gift. <laughs> the Bible talks about giving, giving, right? And so it's obviously not going to be wrong to receive a gift. It's kind of like this. I think about, uh, uh, you know, Jesus, would Jesus ever give us something that would cause us temptation to do wrong? Right? So, so like, if it's wrong for us to give gifts... I mean, I'm sorry, it's wrong for us to receive gifts. Wouldn't giving somebody a gift kind of be tempting them to do wrong? I think of that with the argument that people say about, oh, no, no, Jesus turned water into wine. In Canaan, he, you know, he, he turned the, the water into wine. 
and he waited to the end. They drank all the wine. They didn't have any more. And then he brought out the best wine. And the way they talk about it is like Jesus, like just, you know, here are these guys that are like tipsy, and they've been drinking all night long. And he's like, oh, now I'm going to give you the good stuff, like the super alcoholic stuff. And it's like, that doesn't even make sense. And people will say, oh, no, but it's not a sin to drink. It's just a sin to get drunk. Why would Jesus put that temptation in front of them? They've been drinking all night. Don't you think he should cut them off? <laughs> no, I'm going to give them more wine. Jesus wouldn't do that. And so this is one of the, the strongest arguments to why, and there's a whole lot more, why I don't believe he turned the water into alcoholic wine. Okay, but this is just a grape juice, and it was the new wine, and it was fresh, and it was sweet, and it was wonderful. And they said, wow, this is the best stuff. They didn't mean best in that most alcoholic or something like that. And so God wouldn't tell us, to give and expect us to give to other people if it's wrong to receive a gift. And so, you know, don't let anybody tell you that you should never take a gift. In fact, the Bible has a lot to say about receiving gifts. Let me give you a few examples. How about the gift of salvation? Amen. We should receive the gift of salvation. And that's a gift that God gives, of course, uh, but the Bible calls it a free gift. Romans 5, 18, three times in Romans 5 it says it, by the way. Romans 5, 18 says, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. And again, this is a gift that God gives. The gift of salvation is an incorruptible gift. We understand that. Uh, James 1, 17, 18 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And so God obviously gives gifts, and we definitely ought to receive those gifts. He gives us also the gift of uh, teachers and preachers, who he's called to, uh, to the service, and he's equipped them. Ephesians 4.11 says, And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. And, uh, and so he gives these different gifts. He gives the gifts of the Spirit. Look over at 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12. God is definitely somebody who gives gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. And actually, this whole uh, this whole chapter is speaking a lot about gifts. But let's start at verse twenty-seven. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God has set some in the church: first apostles, secondary prophets, thirdly teachers. After that, miracles. Then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, uh, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet uh, shall I show you a more excellent way. And then he begins to talk about in chapter 13 about charity, and, uh, and even talks about how the best gift does, that we should covet after is to prophesy, which I think is just talking about proclaiming God's word. If we can share God's word with other people, that's the best form of charity that we can show. And, and if we have the gift to do that, that's an amazing gift. Okay, but God gives everybody gifts differently. He gives some people gifts where their mind is very organized and they, they can like lead and they can set things up and they, and they have structure and all this kind of stuff. That's not me, by the way. <laughs> he gives some people these gifts where they can speak lots of languages and they can, uh, you know, he gives some people, I believe he still gives some people the gifts of, of healing in this sense where they know how to take care of people, they know about health, they understand science and, and how the body works or whatever. And, they, and God could use, uh, even people have a gift to do that kind of stuff. Different types of wisdom he grants to different people to be able to help out with his work. <clears throat> Gifts of, uh, some people have the gift of giving. <laughs> some people, like they just don't know how, what, you, you see I don't know how else, uh, I think of this, he's passed away, and so I'm not like stealing any rewards from him, but or taking any rewards away from him or anything, but Brother Webb, uh, many didn't know that Brother Webb, he lived a very modest life, 
Uh, you know, he didn't talk much about it, but he, you know, was a huge giver to the church. And not only to the, to the church as a whole, like the tithes, offerings, and, uh, and all, but then he would just help people randomly and, and do all that he could, and it was a gift of his. Now, if you ever talked to Brother Webb, he didn't have the gift of, what we say, the gift of gab. <laughs> he wasn't really good at talking to people. In fact, he always looked kind of grumpy. He wasn't. That's just how he came across. And uh, he always looked kind of grumpy. He was kind of hard to talk to. He lived alone. You know, he just didn't seem like that kind of guy. But, man, he, the way he showed his love for the Lord and the way he helped and built the church and, and all was to give. You know, he just wanted to give. And so, uh, and I believe that that was something that God gave him. And so the Bible you know, shows us a lot of uh, uh, things that God gave us that we're supposed to accept. But then not only that, we are also supposed to uh, accept hospitality. First Peter uh, 4, 9 says, Use hospitality one to another without grudging. And it's interesting that it says use hospitality. Now, I, I believe we're supposed to be hospitable. I mean, that's one of the qualifications of a pastor. He should love hospitality and and, uh, uh, and be hospitable, but it, I think this is for everybody. Everybody should use hospitality, and they should give hospitality. You know, what do you mean by hospitality? Well, you know, today when we were out caroling, Christmas caroling, you know, somebody uh, came out and said, hey, could I get you all a drink of water? You want anything like that? How many of you guys on Soul when you ever had somebody do that or give you a drink of water or something? You know what? I like to take it. You say, oh, no, I, I always reject it because I'm not going to take from them or anything. Hey, you're robbing them of a blessing. They're giving something to you. God said he's going to bless them for that. And if they give it to you, then they're giving it they're, they're giving it to Christ, right? That's what they, That should be their motivation. I, I, I don't want to rob them of a blessing. Now, look, I'm, I'm not talking about, there are some people that are kind of almost super spiritual, like, no, 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 I'll never accept to give. No, I'm only going to give. I don't want to receive or something like that. I'm not talking about that, but sometimes... Just, it just because it just seems weird to take something, we'll say, no, I don't want to take that. And that's understandable. There's probably a time for that. But look, sometimes when somebody wants to be a blessing to you, they just want to give to you, take it. Take it, you know. Hey, there's nothing wrong with that. There's some people, they'll drive up to Iola, and I'll be like, hey, let me, let me fill the gas tank. Which, by the way, seldom, seldomly do I do that out of my own pocket. <laughs> right? that's, just a, that's just something I want to do. For, uh, from the church to help you pay for that. Take it. No big deal. You don't have to feel bad about taking that. Uh, if I want to take somebody out to dinner, you know, hey, if you offer to take me out to dinner, I'm probably going to say, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Use hospitality. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, so anyway, I could go on. I believe I do not believe it's wrong to receive a gift. The idea is that it's wrong to receive a gift if it's going to mess up your judgment, make you start doing things, you know, uh, favor one person or, or want you know to do something for a person because they they gave you this gift so look if you see yourself going down that road you need to cut it off and say hey this person is trying to control me with giving or something like that right. uh, but uh, hopefully that is not the case most people maybe just wanting to be a blessing and so don't be afraid to receive <laughs> a gift okay but then it's a, it does say it's more blessed to give than to receive. So let's talk about the giving aspect. Back in our uh, text there, Acts 20. Notice what he said here again in verse 35. He said, I have showed you all things, how that ye, how that so. And to remember the words of our Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Notice there that he talked about this idea of laboring. Okay. We should be motivated to give because of the fact that we realize that we have. God's blessed us maybe with something that somebody else doesn't have. I mean, Jesus talked about this. He said some radical things like, hey, if you have two coats and your brother doesn't have any coats, give him one of your coats. You say, oh, that's socialism. No, nobody's forcing you to do it. Jesus just says if you love somebody and you have two, don't be greedy. Don't you want to just share that? You want to help that person because you have two and they don't have any. 
So give them one. That sounds like the Christian thing to do, right? And so there's this principle that says, hey, I have. Let's say uh, I, I know somebody who they physically, now I'm not talking about the people that have two good legs and two good arms, and they're sitting there holding a sign saying, you know, that they want money. Look, that's been proven that most of that, I'm talking about 99.9% .9 of those guys are frauds. Okay, and they can go work, they just don't want to. And so I'm not talking about catering to that and helping them be lazy bums, all right, but I'm saying that if you find somebody who literally can't get a job because of a physical uh, ailment, nowadays it's pretty easy in the United States to get, uh, to get help if that's the case. And so most people aren't, aren't legitimately in need. You know, I had somebody text me uh, yesterday. Uh, he had come to our church for a long time, but he texted and said, hey, do you know anybody in the church who needs money for a Christmas meal? Which is it's an interesting interesting thing that he asked, but it just he, he was burdened for that. Hey, somebody might need money for, to, to have a good Christmas meal or something like that. And honestly, I was racking my brain trying to think, like, who in the church has a great need, like they have no money, they have no food. But we live in a society where if people are that, if they have, if there's some reason for them being that poor where they can't have a Christmas meal, they probably got government aid, <laughs> right? And I can't think of anybody who's just like, we're gonna do without. Now, somebody in here might be thinking, man, I wish you would have sent it my way because I need a good <laughs> Christmas meal. But <laughs> I, just, I just told him, I said, I really can't think of anybody in great need at this point, okay? But let's say you do know somebody and they can't work. It's not their fault. They can't work. Maybe someone lost their job because of the current restrictions or something like that. And you're like, hey, every day I'm blessed with the opportunity to go to work. I'm blessed with, uh, with plenty of money. Uh, you know, I have uh, working hands and legs and a good job or whatever. Well, then it's only natural for us to be motivated to help somebody that doesn't have those things. Okay, and so our, we should be motivated uh, to help and to labor to support the weak. And Paul said, hey, look, just follow my example here. I did that, and you should uh, do that as well. I don't believe it's wrong to give, uh, to give, hoping for something in return. Look, I mean, uh, that should be our main motivation, but I don't think it's wrong to think in terms of, uh, I mean, actually, that is like the definition of investing, and it's only wise to invest your money and to think, hey, I want to put my money to the best use you know, that I can, and so I'm gonna invest here so that I can, it's kind of like, a, you know, I heard somebody was talking about, uh, you know, trying to uh, uh, sell something, okay? I, I knew the guy, this guy, uh, he's, I don't wanna get in, <laughs> go down a rabbit trail here, but anyway, this guy that I know, he's not a Christian, and he was talking about how the in, industry for marketing has changed a lot. And now, like, the thing that they teach you if you take a marketing class is to, is to just give away tons and tons of free products so that you can get your name out there. And everybody gets free things. And, and, uh, and now it's, that's marketing in and of itself. And then they will see the product, they'll like the product, and they'll want to get more. And, uh, and so, look, there's some times where there's an idea that says, hey, we want to just give a bunch of these away or spend a lot of money in this area because it's gonna make more money. I'm not necessarily talking about us like in a church, but maybe you do that at home or that's part of your business or something. That's not wrong, okay? But our motivation should to give shouldn't be, hey, what can I get in return from this all the time, you know? Uh, that we should learn how to give in this, even when we know that we're not gonna get anything in return. The Bible says this, Jesus said, freely ye have received, freely give. And in that term, in that sense, he was talking about preaching the gospel and salvation. And so, hey, look, freely you you have been given, right? You've received it. You, you have salvation. You didn't have to do anything to earn that. And so he's saying, hey, freely you receive, freely give. We should never charge anybody for the gospel. We should never charge anybody to, you know, to do the Lord's work or to minister to somebody. You know, and I was raised... Uh, by the way, uh, whenever I wasn't able to be here after uh, Viviano was born, uh, Brother David uh, preached a message on that. It was a good message. And he called me first and made sure we were right on the same page and all that. And, and we were. I don't think the house of God, that was a bad day, by the way, for the pizza man to show up. <laughs> but anyway, the house of God shouldn't be used, right, to pass around money and all that kind of stuff. And we want to be careful of that because we don't ever want to, uh, to, to, 
you know, trying to profit off of God's word. And I grew up in churches where I don't think they had wicked intentions, but uh, somehow they were taught you need to charge for everything. And so they would have bookstores. And I remember even you couldn't even get the pastor's messages for free. You'd have to uh, pay, you know, five dollars for a CD or something like that, and then you can take it and listen to it. And I was willing to do that sometimes, but you had to pay for it. And then uh, now, obviously, it's easy because a lot of places just put their stuff online. But you know, some of the big name preachers, you try to go online on their website and you try to look up their messages, and it's like, oh, you gotta, you know, contribute <laughs> so much money or something like that to be able to get it. Look, that's that's not right. That's not right. We should be giving. Uh, the gospel and ministering to people and doing all that freely because we received the gospel freely. We uh, God, God didn't charge us for it, and so we should not try to profit off of that. And anyway, that was a good sermon, brother. And so uh, here's what we should focus on: we should give, we should do our do our best. Again, it's not wrong at all times to give something in terms in a way of investing. Okay, that's not wrong. It's a good principle. The Bible even talks about that. But what we should do is try to focus on our giving. This is the kind of giving God's talking about. This is the kind of giving that is more blessed, right, than receiving. And that's something that in this life, it won't be seen by men. Right? There, there's almsgiving, for instance, the Bible talks about giving to somebody in secret, helping somebody out who's in need, not to be seen by men. Maybe doing it in such a way that that person never knows that you're the one that gave to them. Nobody else ever knows that you're the one to give to, the, to, give to them. Uh, you know, this is a difficult thing, but I remember times in my life I've helped somebody out, didn't even tell my wife about it, right? And, and that's the kind of idea. You're thinking, well, what's the point of giving? Nobody knows. Well, that's the wrong attitude. The attitude should be I want to help, and maybe it's not going to be something that I get a return on my investment, at least not in this life, right? But it's something that, uh, that the Lord is keeping track of. The Lord knows. And look, it might not even be something that feels good, right? Because remember, there's a type of giving that we give because that makes us feel good. It gratifies us. Hey, I did a good thing. What does the world say? Pay it forward. Anybody ever had this happen to them where you're going uh, maybe a coffee shop or, or to a restaurant or something, you're going through the drive through and uh, you get up there to pay, and they're like, hey, somebody paid that for you. Now, what? Who? You're looking around trying to figure out who it was. Well, there's this thing that's real popular for a while, and it's just like this idea of paying it forward. And the idea was if you do it to them, right, then karma, <laughs> that's what the word calls it, you're right. Then it's going to come back to you. Somebody's going to do good for you afterwards. And so, uh, or, or, hey, it just feels so good, you know, to be able to give to people and you feel good about yourself. So you want to put it on uh, <laughs> YouTube, make a video about how, you, man, I hate that. Whenever you see somebody like, oh, look at this person, he gives $100 to this waitress. Or something like that. Like now, you just put that waitress's face online, embarrass them, let the whole world know that they're poor and they're needy, and you look at you. Here's a hundred dollar bill, <laughs> right? <Yeah>. Selfie. <laughs> <laughs> like that's wicked. Just give because the Lord's keeping track. And if you don't, and nobody knows that you helped out, but only God knows, the reward is going to be so much better in heaven for that kind of giving. Uh, maybe it'll even hurt to give. Maybe you really will do without, you have to do without in this situation. Or, or uh, you know, uh, just sometimes sacrificial type giving could actually hurt. But look, God's keeping track, okay? So this is the, that's the kind of giving that's more blessed uh, than, than receiving. <clears throat> now let me mention this just because of the subject that's coming up. I, I actually, I didn't plan on, on talking about this, but I was just thinking about and this, and if you, if you're on Facebook or whatever, you might have saw I did a post on this, and I'm, I was legitimately curious about it. I didn't know the concept of tithing. Uh, I've, I've always known. Obviously, it's 10 percent supposed to come out of, you know, your your increase and all that kind of stuff. But I never really realized this until I started looking through the Bible that the uh, the tithe is actually never in the Bible that I can tell. Correct me if I'm wrong. If you find it. But it's never something that people give, right? The tithe. I'm talking about 10% of income. Now, I know there's an argument. Some people say that's just Old Testament. That was for the, the Jews, okay? And if you have that mindset, then you say, well, New Testament giving is just like 
forget about 10%, you know, just, just give every, give all that you can. And so, uh, so either way, because, and the reason, the reason I say that is because the majority of people that are against tithing, you know, if you find out more about them, hey, it's not that it's, they're against 10%, they're against just giving at all. They don't want to give, all right? But the Bible talks about uh, uh, the tithe. Never do you find the words giving the tithe. You find the phrase paying the tithe. You find the phrase, uh, uh, what's the other one? Uh, let's see, paying the tithe or bringing the tithe to the, to the, you know, to the house of God. And they bring it or they pay it, uh, but you never see giving the tithe. What you see is giving offerings, and you see giving, uh, you know, give, gifts in that sense, but you don't see the tithe. Okay, so that's something that's kind of different idea of like, hey, it should be just kind of expected that everybody is giving. Hey, it belongs to the Lord, and you're just giving it back to Him. All right, but the but actually offering is something that nobody's going to see. Uh, you know, it's just a secret thing that you want God to see, and God's going to reward you in heaven. Okay, uh, now I'm not saying that if you don't give the tithe, he's going to punish you necessarily, but he did the children of Israel <laughs> 70 years, and, uh, and uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of another story for another message, but 70 years of captivity was largely to do with them not following some of the, the laws of the, of the tithing. They had more to do with the land and everything, but uh, but anyway, so the concept is this. Yes, it is fine to receive gifts. It's right to receive gifts. If nobody ever received gifts, then nobody could ever give gifts. Okay? So there's a time to receive gifts. There's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's, a, it's a good thing. But there's also a principle in the Bible that we need to learn that it is more blessed to give than to receive. And it's something that we can say that and, uh, and we can make ourselves sound good by saying it. But it's really, really hard principle because almost every time we give, there's a little bit of a motivation in there. Hey, that person that I gave that to is going to like me more. Hey, I'm giving to my... Now, let me say this. There are people out there, it's, usually it's like a, in a divorced home or something like that, where you see people trying to buy the love and affection of their kids. You know what I mean? Or like maybe an abusive parent, God forbid. Uh, but, you know, in order to keep them quiet or to buy back their affection, they'll try to, you know, just buy them everything under the sun or something like that. And that's that's terrible. That's another story. But for the most part, when you love your children, you, you want to give to them. You know, you want to help them out. You don't want you're not expecting things in, in return from them. And that's just kind of the nature of it, which I think is why the best gifts, the perfect gifts come from God. Right. Because he gives perfectly. He he doesn't expect anything back for what he gives to us. And uh, now he deserves it. We should. Uh, we owe him a great debt, theoretically, because all he's done for us. But then again, how does God want us to repay that debt? Love other people. Give to other people. When we give to other people, we're actually pleasing God. That's what he wants back. There's nothing. What, what can we give to the God of the universe? Right? The all-powerful God. We can't give anything to him. But he wants us to give to others. And so that principle is, uh, is easy to understand, like a, like a parent gives to his child. But most of the time, we, we think in terms of when we give to other people, like that person's going to like me better if I give to them. I remember uh, church camp. Church camp, you give, them, you give all these teenagers a list of things, or preteen, a list of things that they need to bring to camp. You need to bring your bedrolls, you know, your, your pillowcase, you need to bring so many changes of clothes, you need to bring... Uh, your Bible notes. I mean, they give them all this big list, and they recommend a certain amount of money. Right? They've already paid for the camp, but here's a certain amount of money that you can play. You can go to the snack shop, and you can buy some snacks or whatever. And what I found, like a lot of times, we bring kids, and their parents would give them, you know, twenty dollars. Some kids would come with fifty dollars to pay on snacks for the whole week. Okay, sometimes more. I guess. But anyway. So let's say a kid comes in, he's got $30, $50. Let's say he's got $50, right? You're thinking, man, that's going to last a while. You got like $10 a day to spend on really cheap snacks, like, a, you know, 25 cents for, a, uh, for an ice cream cone or something like that. I don't remember what they cost. <clears throat> Dollar for a hot dog, I don't know. But you got plenty of money at camp, all right? But here's what would happen. I would find out that some of these teens that I took, they'd be completely out of money by day two. <laughs> And I'm like, what did you do with your money? 
And they start saying, well, I gave some to so-and-so, and this other guy came, and he asked me for money, so I gave him money. And I'm like, well, why did you do that? And so I began to notice this trend that was happening at a camp, and what would happen is, as soon as they got, uh, they, all these kids would be hanging around the snack shop, and as soon as somebody breaks out their money, they would befriend that guy so that he would pay, the, for the, pay some snacks for them. And this person's thinking, hey, this is a way I can get friends. I can pay, <laughs> pay for them to have some snacks. And then once all they're out of money, guess what? Those friends are gone, man. <laughs> they weren't friends. They were just trying to get money. And sometimes we can be conditioned to think, hey, I can buy people's affection. No, you can't. No, you can't. If you can buy their affection, it's not real affection. <laughs> okay. But sometimes it's tempting to have this idea that we're trying to win people's favor or we're trying to give, hoping that we can get something in return. And look, that's not the kind of giving that's blessed of, of God. The kind of giving that's blessed of God is when we don't do anything expecting something in return. So that's a good message to preach right before Christmas, right? <laughs> if you didn't give somebody a gift, hey, you know. <laughs> anyway, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, and I thank you for all that you've given to us. Definitely, we thank you for the free gift of salvation. We thank you also for the gifts that you've given, spiritual gifts, uh, the gifts uh, uh, that you've given to the church to help, uh, help us to grow and to learn and to grow closer to you. Lord, I pray that you'll help us as you bless us and have given us the ability to work and to, to earn an income and, and have understanding and, uh, of some things and to be stronger than many other people in this world. I pray that you help us to be considerate of those who are weaker, are less fortunate, and aren't able to, uh, to have those, those blessings. And help us just do what we can to give and to share those things, not to be seen of men, uh, but, but just because we know that you're watching in heaven and you will, uh, you will bless us for that. And we do believe that. We don't see those words. We, we see the words of Christ that Paul, uh, that Paul said. He, sa he said about uh, being more blessed to give than to receive. And we by faith, just like everything we read in the Bible, we by faith accept that, Lord. And I pray you help us to uh, continue that on. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.